The following presentation is brought to you without commercial interruption by our patrons over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. When you can't make it out to Gettysburg, we want to bring Gettysburg to you. And we can only do that with more support from our listeners. So please, consider becoming a patron over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg, where you will find our premium content made exclusively for our patrons. That's patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Okay, so um, uh, as usual, um, my name is Tim Smith. For those of you who have never been to a program before, he, already, he knows who I am anyway. But um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the roads that led into the, get, the town of Gettysburg at the time of the battle and some simple things about them and then also maybe some new revelations I have about them, whatever I think of at the moment. But um, uh, if you have any questions as we go along, it's probably easier to go ahead and ask questions at that moment so that um, you know I can uh, correct them instead of the end. But just go ahead and ask questions. And uh, um, this is a, a program that's uh, pretty, um, uh, pretty um, near and dear to my uh, research. I've always been interested in the roads that led into the town at the time of the battle. I should tell you that next week I'm going to do a program on the uh, history of the Farnsworth House and the fighting around it. I've done that program, or a variation of that program, or a walking tour several times. So some of you have been on that program before. But um, we're going to do that. Sorry, Tim. And then on uh, the 19th, um, uh, before Christmas, I will not be here. Oh, you guys got to do it, Tim. Sorry. Um, I, uh, I have to take my son to a uh, Ravens game. And then uh, on the 26th, the day after Christmas, I'm going to do a program that I, a newer program that I really haven't done before, but it's the, sort of the history of commercialization in Gettysburg. And so in that program, I'm going to talk about things like the Springs Hotel and the Gettysburg Electric Railway and some of the historical tourist attractions and battlefield tour guides, but also uh, I'm going to end it with my... Uh, three million slides of every motel complex that's ever been in Gettysburg. So if you want to see the, Mead, the Lee Mead Inn or the Battlefield Hotel or, you know, um, some of those older um, places, I have a lot of, lot of postcards of all the hotels. So I thought just commercialization might be a neat subject. And then, of course, you know, in January, at some point, I'll do a program on uh, Jenny Wade. I do a yearly program on Jenny Wade with all my uh, new and interesting research. I don't know if um, I told everybody, but we did actually have uh, some a crime detective lab from the University of West Virginia come and actually shoot a laser uh, through the bullet holes. And uh, they did a whole study of uh, where the bullet may have come from. So hopefully in January I'll have that uh, ready to go. And then also I have something I've been working on, and it's a, a program about a chronology of General Meade and where he is from moment to moment, you know, during the three days of the battle. So I thought I'd do something different on General Meade. Because I, I noticed that, I, and you know, I, I mentioned uh, on our program, our walking tour, that I really enjoyed Kurt Masterson Brown's book on General Meade. But it was more about the things that were going on in his mind and all the things he had to deal with. And it wasn't, uh, didn't have much information about his whereabouts from a moment to moment, the things he does on the battlefield. So that's what I thought I'd uh, uh, cover now. But, okay, so I still can picture Bruce Catton in a documentary um, with Stacy Keach. And it was in the early 80s. No, I guess it was, yeah, let's say mid 80s. Because it came out after Stacy Keach was the star of uh, The Blue and the Gray. Yeah. What was his name? Major Sharp or something like that? Yeah. And you know he's married to Mary Wade, who was killed at the Battle of Hanover in that. But uh, he was a narrator. He came here to the Farnsworth house. He stayed here. Um, I have pictures of him here. And he did this documentary. There's a scene in the documentary where he's in the cupola of the Lutheran Theological Seminary when it's the Adams County Historical Society. I never met him. I never got to talk to him. But it's a pretty cool documentary. But they have clips from Bruce Catton in it. 
And he says, in the beginning of it, I'm sitting on the battlefield. Um, obviously, it's filmed years earlier. And he says, the battle was fought at Gettysburg because the roads led them there. And I think that's something I try to tell people on every tour of the battlefield I give. Right at the beginning, I'm like, hey, the battle was fought here because all the roads lead here. That's the number one major reason the battle is fought here. And, you know, once you get over that, then you might get a question about the shoe factory. But uh, I like to do that. So, oh, here it is. Here's this quote from the book, Gettysburg, the Final Fury. And you can see uh, he talks about the road hub and how important a road hub is there in, in that booklet. Now, you know, as far as the roads are concerned, they lead to other major cities and towns. I don't know how many people have thought about this, but um, if you think of the nearest, largest towns, you have, uh, starting uh, out to the east, we have York, Pennsylvania, and then you can call Westminster a major town. I think Westminster might have about 8,000 people at that time. And then, of course, Baltimore, uh, just to the south. And then uh, we have uh, Frederick, and um, what else do I have there on the map? Oh, I have Tommy Town on the map. And then uh, uh, out to the west, Chambersburg, of course, and uh, Carlisle and Harrisburg. Just to give you an idea that the roads lead to places, other larger towns. Um, a guy named uh, D.C. Jacobs, who was a prominent member of the Adams County Historical Society, in 1942 at one of our meetings, uh, talked about the roads. And he talked about how roads are important in general. And then he said this at the end, which I find fascinating. More roads intersect in Gettysburg than any other place in Pennsylvania. Yeah. No, Philadelphia. Keep, they, they have less than 10 roads, yes. Yeah. Um, he also told a lot of ghost stories, and he was really into dowsing this guy, D.C. Jacobs. So here is a simple map with the roads that lead to our town, lead in and out of the town. And I just wanted to talk about the roads. So if we start off to the uh, west, we have the Fairfield Road which of course leads to Fairfield, Pennsylvania. But oftentimes, it's referred to as the Hagerstown Road. So Fairfield's only about um, uh, six or seven miles down the road, but Hagerstown is like, what, um, 35 miles. Uh, there used to be, uh, years ago, a sign at Confederate Avenue and the Fairfield Road that told you the importance of that road and the fact that the Southern Army retreated on that road to leave the battlefield. And at one time, oh, they actually put them back. There were itinerary plaques along Confederate Avenue that told you the retreat route of the Southern Army and a little bit of detail. And uh, they actually put those back in a slightly different manner uh, in recent years. But uh, the Fairfield Road, of course, is to the west. And then we have the Chambersburg Turnpike, which we're going to talk about in our program. Uh, and that, that uh, we'll talk about the establishment of that. That's, of course, the main road the Southern Army used to get to Gettysburg. And then we have the Mummersburg Road. I'm fond to say Mummersburg. You can say Mumalsburg, if you like. And uh, the Mummas that form Mummersburg are related to the Mummas that lived on the Antietam battlefield also, and they were Dunkers. And there was a Dunker church in Mummersburg, you might know. Uh, north of town, we have uh, the Newville Road. I like this particular map, and it's made by someone, I don't know if I like the person who made it. Is that Hal Jepson? Is that how you pronounce his name? He, he's a map maker, but he did a great job on this map because he actually gets it right. A lot of times, people have the Carlisle Road on these historic Gettysburg maps as the road that leads out of the town that here is the Newville Road. But the, today, we call that Newville Road the Biggerville Road, and that kind of is how you go to Carlisle. But you gotta remember, when you get towards Bendersville, they put in a new loop that goes over to the old Carlisle Road that goes by that, um, I don't even know what it's called now. Shanks, 
uh, tasty treat. You know, there's a little drive in there. And there's a road that goes over from the old Newville Road to the Carlisle Road. But that connector road was not there at the time of the Civil War. So if you went up the road through Biggerville, you were on your way over the mountain to Newville in uh, Cumberland County. And at the car wash north of town, you had to make a right there to go on the Carlisle Road. And so the old Carlisle Road today is called Table Rock Road. And then, of course, we have the Harrisburg Road, which sometimes is called the Heidlersburg Road because it leads to Heidlersburg. Sometimes it's called the State Road because it was put in by the state to connect Gettysburg to Harrisburg. And, of course, that's Old 15 before uh, Route 15 was placed around Gettysburg. And, you know, uh, if you drive up the Harrisburg Road, that's why you have all those old motels all along the road. Uh, people have to stay there before the modern Route 15 was put in here. And then, if we go off to the right, we're talking about the Hunterstown Road. And the Hunterstown Road is a pretty substantial road, especially early in the town's history. And of course, you know, Hunterstown, you might not think of as much of a town if you go there today. But it's the second oldest town in Adams County. And the Hunterstown Road should be on our list of roads. And then we have, of course, the York Road. It leads to York, Pennsylvania, and, of course, you know, uh, modern Route 30. And then the Hanover Road, uh, which leads over to Hanover, Pennsylvania, Route 116 today. It's interesting that today, uh, 116 leads through the town and goes out to Fairfield Road. And in historic terms, the Fairfield Road was more closely connected with uh, the York Road. Well, we'll talk about that probably. Um, and then south, we have the Baltimore Turnpike, 52 miles to Baltimore, which, um, of course, I'm from there, so it's very, uh, you know, very uh, important to me. And then the Tony Town Road, leading straight south out of the town of Gettysburg, leads to that metropolis in Carroll County, Maryland, um, you know, Tony Town. Uh, and then the Emmitsburg Road, which just leads down to Emmitsburg, Maryland, and Frederick County, uh, not too far away. So, you know, if you look at this map, you'll notice that there are 12 roads that lead in and out of our road hub. And the fact that there are 12 roads was not at all lost on early historians. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, books that discusses the road hub. You know, a lot of books on the battle at the beginning will have a synopsis of uh, <coughs> the geography of the area. And they'll say a little bit about the roads. And uh, in uh, Beecham's book, uh, who was a member of the 2nd Wisconsin Infantry during the battle, and he wrote a book called, you know, the Gettysburg, the most pivotal battle of the Civil War, or something like that, 1911. He actually has a paragraph discussing a dozen highways lead into and converge at Gettysburg, and they were all there in 1863. And then he has a paragraph on each one of the roads. And he mentions that he's counting the Newville Road, the old Carlisle Road, and he's also counting the Hunterstown Road in his dozen roads. Um, Edward Sackpole, who wrote another one of my favorite books to read, They Met at Gettysburg. I don't know if I like to read it because I think it's a good history of the battle. I just, you know, I just very fond of, of that book. And he says in, in the book that um, um, it's the hub of a network of 12. And he even qualifies it. 10 main roads and two branch roads. So he's counting uh, the Newville Road or the Old Carlisle Road. One of those is a branch road and, uh, you know, the Hunterstown Road. I'm always interested in, if you count um, you know, if you're only using 10 roads and you're not counting one of the two roads north of town, do you not count the road that leads to Carlisle? Do you count the Newville Road as one of those roads? Which one are you not counting? These are important questions. <laughs> and then, of course, um, Henry Rope, so here's another just example, in 1913 wrote about the 12 roads from all points of the compass meet at Gettysburg. And I don't know if you remember, but in the 19... 90s, there was a CD-ROM for your computer. Might have been for the Commodore. And it was called 12 Roads to Gettysburg. It was the game. It was a really bad video game. 
Okay, so some people say there's 11 rooms. Are you aware of this? So here's probably early on, here's two of the more famous 11 room uh, uh, descriptions. Here's a Chapman Biddle, who was the colonel of the 121st Pennsylvania Infantry, fought in the first day's battle. He wrote a regimental history. He also wrote, uh, uh, he spoke a ded dedication ceremony of the monument. Um, and so he wrote some stuff about it. 11, 11 roads, several of them well macadamized. I like that, macadamized. And you know, I'm not into macadam like Gary is, so you have to, you have to talk to Gary about, uh, about that. Um, and then also the history of the 141st Pennsylvania, you might notice, says that Gettysburg is a center of 11 roads that radiate at every point of the compass, like spokes from the hub of a wheel. And I think the spokes from the hub of the wheel is something that when I was young, I would come here and go to the various museums in town and hear the, the thing on the tour bus. That, that, was, uh, that was stated a lot in these early um, accounts and histories. Okay, so 10 rows. We have most sources state that there are 10 rows. John Vanderslice was the official historian at the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association. And they wrote a history um, of the GBMA uh, when it, in the 1890s when the grounds were about to be taken over by the War Department. So in, in that history in 1894, they talk about the 10 rows. And I should say the War Department in the War Department literature, uh, every time the War Department was um, you know, writing something official and mentioned the roads, they would mention 10 roads. And here's another good uh, source that a lot of people read, the Comte de Paris. He wrote a book about the Civil War, and he wrote a book about the Battle of Gettysburg in 1888, and he says there's 10 roads and one railway. I like that. But, of course, um, Let's see, John Batchelder uh, says there are 11 roads. And one of my questions is, if you say there's 11 roads, uh, which road are you not counting? Are you not counting the Hunterstown Road? You're not counting the Newville Road? You're not counting the um, Old Carlisle Road, the road at least directly to Carlisle? I don't know. Yeah. But he says it's the center of 11 different roads which radiate from it like the spokes of a wheel from a common center. I like this last part. And um, I, I said this, I, I brought this up a couple years ago when I did this program, um, which rendered this locality one of peculiar significance as a military strategic point. The turnpikes leading from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia and Baltimore once important thoroughfares, what's that word? Bifurcate. It's going to be bifurcate. No? Bifurcate? I've never seen that word ever in any written book. Okay. Bifurcate. Okay, so the National Park Service insists there are nine roads. Might come to you as some surprise. But here I just picked two things that I found really quickly uh, online, and these are National Park Service official reports. And you can see, in 1863, nine roads radiated from Gettysburg. It's just like they keep saying that there are 1,300 monuments, markers, and tablets, and they start counting like, you know, 50 years ago. You know? So which ones are they not counting if they only have nine? This is my question. They have their number and they're sticking to it. That's right. Okay, Elsie Singmaster, you just bought one of her books from me. Elsie Singmaster was a novelist who lived in Gettysburg and wrote like a hundred books and articles on local history and a lot of um, uh, novel, novel type, you know, characters and stuff. But in a history of the town she wrote in 1913 during the 50th anniversary, she says it's the meeting place of eight roads. So again, have they even looked at a map and they're counting? What are they not counting? 
what if, if, you know, if you come down this low? Okay, Samuel Pennypacker, who was in the 26th Pennsylvania Emergency Regiment during the battle, and um, uh, he wrote a history of the state of Pennsylvania in 1914. He was governor of Pennsylvania at one time, and he wrote that seven roads needed Gettysburg. I, I think the seven roads can be excused because in some books, I think Abner Doubleday's book, he mentions that General Buford has to cover seven roads against the southern advance into Gettysburg on the morning of July 1st. So when these people have, you know, they've read Abner Doubleday, and they are thinking about the first day of the battle, and they don't realize he's talking about the ones they're defending, not all the roads that come into town. So some of these things are probably written by people who haven't sat down with a map and just counted the roads. But these roads that we're talking about are the roads that brought the armies to Gettysburg, and the troops marched on each of these roads to get here. I, I wanted to point out also an observation. This is just an observation. The National Park Service boundary is against nine of the ten roads. Have you noticed that? That there's only one road leading into the town where the Park Service boundary does not um, border that road. Now, what road is that? The York Pike. Oh, I'm talking about the ten roads. Good. You, you were thinking way outside the box. Well, yeah. So if we go to the 12 roads, we're in trouble. But just for one of the 10 roads, it's the York Pike. And look at the York Pike today. Maybe you could argue that it built up so much because there's no, um, you know, there's no uh, other place where this development and commercialism can expand because of the horrible battlefield that's encroached upon the economic opportunities of our local people. I like when they get really angry about it, you know. But, um, uh, or you could just say that, wow, you know, no preservation efforts on that road. Look, look what that road's become. And, of course, you might also argue that Scribbin Township is not the most friendly uh, area for battlefield preservationists. Uh, here's a Harper's Weekly uh, map of the town of Gettysburg from July 18th, 1863. And this is one of the really early attempts to try to give... Uh, the reader, uh, you know, some idea of where we're uh, talking about. Um, and you can see on this one they have um, the Hanover Road coming out into the Baltimore Pike, which I really like. Um, but let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. They have six roads shown on this map. And I, I think some of the stuff on the map is really interesting, like Willoughby, Willoughby's Run is very prominent and Marsh Creek isn't. And then if you look down the Baltimore Pike, you've got two taverns, and then you have Germantown. And several times in our local you know, history, history um, uh, discussions, I pointed out to people, this is the first usage as, of the name Germantown. And there is a sign that says Germantown on the way to Littlestown, as you'll pass not far from Alloway Creek if, you're, if you look for it. But uh, it's really an interesting uh, map of the area. Here is the 1822 map of York and Adams County. And um, this is one I have at the Historical Society at the State Archive. They have a really nice colored version of this map where they actually, the different townships are in different colors. And you can see that in here they actually have um, 11 of the 12 roads we are discussing, I believe. Let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 2, 4, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Yeah, they have 11 roads. And now this is interesting because this is 1822. And one of the roads is not placed in until 1829. And that road is not shown on this map. And that road is the Newville Road. Carlisle Street was not called Carlisle Street in our early history of our town because it didn't lead to Carlisle. Um, it was called North Baltimore Street. And it wasn't until 1829, if you look at our town, that they put that road straight out of the town. The road coming down from the top of the map that intersects with the Mummersburg Road 
is the old Carlisle Road. And the Newville Road would run straight north of the town and then straight up um, and then, you know, intersect where the car wash is, and then the old car law road didn't go all the way to the Mothersburg Road. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But I really like um, that particular map. And of course, we have the 1858 um, uh, wall map. It was kind of drawn in 1857, and it shows all the farmers who lived here at the time, and it shows the road network. And it's a pretty accurate um, uh, description and uh, detail of all the different roads that come into the town. So as far as early roads go, roads are very important in the early history of any county or area. As early as settlers come in, they need to establish roads because you need to bring wagons and supplies in to build, you know, um, for construction purposes and also, you know, for furniture purposes. You can make stuff, you know, <laughs> But if you want to grow as an economy, you need roads to bring things in, in and out. And taverns are established along these roads. The earliest road in Adams County is the old Monocacy Road, which was an old Indian trail uh, that was used prior to European settlement. But in 1740, they winded, widened it and made it into a road. And that's a road that goes from York, Pennsylvania, down through Hanover, down through Littlestown, to Frederick, Maryland, and the Monocacy River. And that's shown on the bottom part of the map. So that's um, 1740. In 1747, a road was placed in from outside of York, out across through Abbottstown, what is now Abbottstown, and then through what is now New Oxford. Neither one of those towns were there at the time. And then there was an intersection created at where Route 30 and Swift Run Road is located today. And the northern part branch of that road was known as the Black Scap Road. And it ran out through there, across through Mummersburg, and out uh, through the South Mountain Range. And the southern trace of that road ran through what is now Gettysburg and out through uh, Fairfield and over to the old Waynesboro Road, which leads from Emmitsburg to Waynesboro, put up in, in uh, 1750. So the, on this map, it's called the Nicholson Gap Road, sometimes called Nichols Gap. Uh, sometimes it's called the Marsh Creek Road. It's the southern part of this road, and the northern part's the Black Scap Road. These roads were laid out in 1747. So 1747. And then, uh, you know, we're going to talk about, oh, I should mention that the early roads in our county were east-west roads. They connected the people who lived, were settling around Philadelphia and in Lancaster County and the county seat of York with the settlements out here that were being created in the 1730s and 40s. As Baltimore emerged as a major economic powerhouse following the French and Indian War, there was a need for roads north and south to connect the settlers in Pennsylvania with greater economic opportunities in Maryland. And the Baltimore Shippensburg Road, which basically is the Baltimore Pike to Gettysburg and then the Momersburg Road up to Shippensburg was laid out in 1749. I'm sorry, 1769. So 1769, right after the French and Indian War. And so, um, and you can see also they've shown this map, uh, kind of uh, 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 the Hunterstown Road going up and down. But that's enough about that for a moment. Oh, I was going to, I should mention one more road, uh, which is today 234. And you can see it up there running uh, east west from East Berlin across towards where is, what is now. Uh, Bigelowville and Arnsdale and coming out on the Black Scap Road uh, on uh, you know modern Route 30. The old Manalan Road was meant to connect the um, meeting houses of the early Quakers, specifically the Manalan Meeting House, which was actually located at that time around uh, what is now Center Mills, and then they expanded the road farther out. But that road, the old Manalan Road, is about 1750. So again, an, an early road. Um, we have this map of our area from 1770. It's uh, at the State Archives. It's the Nicholas Skull map. 
And of course, in 1770, Adams County is not formed yet, and so we're talking about York County. And um, here is actually a really nice um, color version of the map I got from the Pennsylvania State Archives. And I have a field day with this map. There's so many things listed on the map that are interesting to me, and so many roads that are shown on the map that, um, that fit into my topic. But there is where the town of Gettysburg would eventually be. Because again, we're talking about 1770, 16 years prior to the laying out of our town. So it's pretty early. And you can see they show Presbyterian meeting houses. And you can see, uh, if you look where my circle is, Rock Creek, which is east of the town, crossing um, the 1747 uh, Marsh Creek Road. And then Marsh Creek, which crosses uh, west of it. So you see why I put the town on the map where I did. Isn't that just fascinating? And you see up at near uh, above it, you see where it says Manalin, and it says Quaker Meeting House. And see the Quaker Meeting House is at uh, Center Mills. You see where the road kind of stops there and doesn't connect all the way over through what is now bigger than Arnsville to uh, Route 30. Now, here is a 1765 um, survey for the 365 acres of land that it would eventually, actually this is 381 according to the survey, for Samuel Geddes's uh, property. And you might look at towards the bottom of it, you can see the Marsh Creek Road is mentioned by name. And again, this is a survey from 1765. It's the actual survey. I wanted to mention that the original Marsh Creek Road did not necessarily follow the route of the modern Route 30. And um, I, I didn't want to make it too difficult to explain, but out beyond Walmart, the original Black Scout Road came into Gettysburg, oh, let me see if I get in here for a second, along the property of uh, John Galbraith. So it actually, instead of coming down Route 30 into the town like it does today, the Black Scout Road came down across the top of um, what is referred to as the Daniel Lady Farm. And if you've ever been on one of their tours, they talk about how there was an old roadbed that came across the northern side of the property. And it actually joined what is now the Hanover Road. That road was not there at the time. And then it crossed the creek somewhere on a bridge, um, probably just north of where the Hanover Road Bridge is. And then it came into the town along um, what we believe is a Racehorse Alley. And then it joined the Baltimore Pike uh, somewhere in the middle of the town. When James Geddes laid out the town in 1786, he sort of erased the trace of the original road and moved the roads uh, to suit his uh, town a little better. So you just have to keep that in mind. So the point here is that the original 1747 Marsh Creek Road did not come into the town exactly the way that Route 30 comes into the town today. Here's the Warren survey of the battlefield. And I think it's interesting on here that you can see the bridges up there along uh, the York Pike that were established when uh, the, it's hard for me to say exactly when the uh, old route of the Marsh Creek Road was changed and the York Pike was established, but a turnpike company was established and then they put a bridge across um, uh, the creek up there and eliminated the fording probably that was on the original Marsh Creek Road. Bridges are very important in the history of roads. You build a road to make it easier for people to travel on and you build a bridge so they can cross a creek. And these stone bridges like the one that was once on the York Turnpike are all built about the same time in the early 1800s. To me, that looks like an 1815 bridge. If I searched hard enough, I would probably be able to be fi find when 
the company, the York Turnpike Company, is advertising for someone to build a bridge at that site. They pay people to build these large bridges. So in this view, we're on the railroad tracks, and uh, just on the other side of uh, the bridge would be like Beer Mart. What is that called now? I keep changing names. Uh, the pretzel place? No, print and frame. The print and frame place, okay. But we're looking towards Culp Hill. I think that's just a fabulous view. And that's a, uh, an 1880s view. Here's another early view that we have of the bridge. Um, and this is probably not far from uh, the parking lot of that building, looking south at the bridge. Uh, and you can see on the old maps, there's a toll gate house along um, uh, the York Pike. And that toll gate house was somewhere um, uh, near where the railroad veers off. Uh, it's, near, it's between the Hunterstown Road, and you can see in the crossing, probably out near the car dealership there on the right. But tolls are very important to these early roads. You have roads that are built by the state. You have roads that are authorized by the county, and the county government pays for the road to be built or gets money from the state for road improvements. And then you have private companies that build roads, turnpikes. And so the turnpike company was a group of private investors that usually went to the state legislature and had a company um, incorporated. And then they would sell stock, and then they would use the money generated to improve a road or to build a new road and to make it easier for people to travel, especially people taking goods and supplies from one area to another. You know, farmers taking their crops to the market. And then they charged money for people to use the road. And then uh, every year or so they, had, they gave dividends out and they paid uh, the people who invested in a road um, the profits. And it's interesting with these turnpikes, they seem to um, be successful for a time, but then they just sort of fade away. And uh, um, prior to the Civil War, most of the turnpikes are not being actively used. And locals don't think that they should pay the toll. It's one thing we, it's a common denominator. So it's called a turnpike, and you know, the, the road, early roads, the, the gate doesn't come down on the road. It turns to the side. It's a turned pike. And a pike being a long pole, uh, sort of like a, uh, you know, use a jousting uh, that was a military term uh, that, that crossed the road and then it would throw it to the side and you could pass. Now, um, the 1747 road I mentioned east of Gettysburg had a different route where it entered the town, and west of Gettysburg it also had a different route where it exited the town. And you can see on this particular map, this is 1869, and this is the map associated um, with the, uh, uh, the battle of Gettysburg. Obviously they're trying to draw the battlefield, and on it they show the original 1747 road, which we refer to as the old Millerstown Road because some people call Fairfield Millerstown. Although, John Miller, when he laid out the town in 1784, calls it Fairfield and his original deeds. So, but I think they refer to it as John Miller's Town, and so they call that the Millerstown Road. But you can see that this road came out of the town where uh, Route 30 and the Chambersburg Pike intersect uh, at, the, at West Street. And at one time, there was Springs Avenue, the old Millerstown Road, and the Chambersburg Pike all intersected at that location. Today, only two roads intersect there, obviously Route 30 and Springs Avenue. But the 1747 road is still there and still being used. Off the top of my head, I think in 1832, the town extended West Middle Street out to join uh, the Millerstown Road. And also, the Chambersburg Pike had been built in 1815, and they no longer used, uh, needed to use that segment of the old Millerstown Road, and eventually it was removed. 
there's where the Adams County Historical Society uh, is, you know, where we lease the Wolf House today. So in case you're curious about that. Here is an awesome photograph from July of 1863 by the Tysons of Gettysburg. And this photograph is taken basically in back of the Wolf House where the Adams County Historical Society is, and we are looking directly down the Millerstown Road. So Mill Middle Street is off to our right, and Old Route 30 is off to our left, Buford Avenue, and this road that today leads through the middle of the development along Springs Avenue is not there anymore. It just goes right through the backyards of the houses on Springs Avenue. So at the time of the battle, there was this road that no longer exists, which is just fascinating. Here's an 1880s view, uh, looking down Middle Street from Seminary Ridge, and on the left of the view, you can kind of see, by that time, the old Millerstown Road is not being used anymore. It's hard to see in this version, but there's actually a fence built across the road so people can't use it, and that area is just kind of turned into farmland. So the 1747 road was gone by the 1880s. Okay. And then, of course, the Millerstown Road ran out, uh, of course, um, to Fairfield. And here's a great view of it from the 1880s. This is on Her Ridge. And this is the old Her Ridge Road. And we're looking down the hill towards the Her Tavern, or Black Horse Tavern, across Marsh Creek, where the creek passed. And we have some early photographs of um, the Black Horse Tavern. If you stop there today and look at it, the stone portion of the building is still there, but the wooden building, which probably dated from the 1740s, is no longer there today. So it's been removed. And that's probably um, an 1880s image. I don't have a good firm date on that, that photograph. But on the Warren map, you can see Black Horse Tavern, and you can see the bridge that crosses the creek at that location. And here we have um, a 1900 photograph of the stone bridge that crossed Marsh Creek on the old, you know, um, uh, Marsh Creek Road or the old Fairfield Road or Hagerstown Road. So that's the bridge that would have been there at the time of the battle, and it's quite a formidable uh, bridge. And then here's another view of the bridge. We've got lots of photographs of it. I think Tipton went out there and he took three or four photographs that day. And we're looking uh, back towards the town of Gettysburg at the Her Tavern across the stream, and you can see that some people just splash into the stream at that point, and you know they don't need to use the bridge. But you can kind of look onto the uh, abutments of the bridge, not too much different than like Burnside's bridge at uh, Antietam Creek. Probably, you know, these bridges are all built at the same time. Okay, so before I talk about the next thing, we're going to take a, a couple minute break here. We'll take uh, five minutes or so. I want you to give an opportunity to get another drink if you need to get a drink. I'll, I'll mention the Sarah to come up. Question? Yes, on the, the non toll roads, who would have maintained the bridges? Would it be the county like they do? Yeah, it would have been probably the county. I bet you they were fighting constantly about the maintenance of the roads. Some of the roads started off as being county roads, and then a turnpike company or something took over the road, improved the road, and then put toll gates out, like the York Pike. Like that was a, um, a, uh, a county road, and then it became a toll road. Um, but I bet you that's a, a point of contention. And of course, that's one of the reasons why covered bridges are so popular, and I'll talk about a couple of them coming up, um, just their locations. But covered bridges are built because the roof actually protects the bridge and the, you know, in some sense, um, so that, uh, you know, it requires less maintenance. Of course, you can see here what they did is they just arched the bridge and just throw dirt on it. Um, but I guess repairing these bridges and keeping them in good repair was a constant battle. That's why they formed Penda, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, so we're going to take a break right now. So everybody might want to, if um, Sarah, you know, tell her if she wants to get some drinks or something. She might want to come back.
Yeah, look what happened to oh, and if you want to, you should you should look at the books I have for sale. Buy some books. You don't have to carry them next door if you don't. They're going to be in the bookstore. You know, um, in the gift shop. I don't know if you noticed, but we've been really increasing the military books in there. I have a large collection of military books there now. What? What is the oldest township in yeah. what you call Adams County? I call Western North Town. So a township. Some of the townships in our county were formed without boundaries while this was Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. So the oldest township, I believe, is Cumberland Township. And I believe it was founded in uh, 1747. And I know Mount Pleasant Township gives a date of 1749. But originally, the townships were found. The Germany Township is early. Hamilton Bond Township is early. But they don't really have boundaries. Like Franklin Township, today, as we know, was part of the original Cumberland Township. So they're kind of vast areas. So I don't know when they established the county lines, but several of the townships in the county were founded when we were still Lancaster County. Now, uh, the towns, as far as town goes, you know, actual towns, Abbottstown is the earliest town, found in 1763. And then in 1764, we had um, uh, um, Hunterstown and uh, East Berlin, I believe. In 1765, it's McSherrystown and Littlestown, um, you know, Gettysburg, 1786. But the early ones are uh, 1763, 1764, 1765. So here's a, a map. This is from the 1786 sale by Samuel Geddes to his son, you know, the sheriff, to his son James. And it shows the area that would be uh, Gettysburg. And this drawing is actually from 1765. And you can see down on the left-hand side it says Reverend Mr. Dobbins. And you can see uh, the road, the Black's Gap Road which is really the Baltimore Shippensburg Road. And then upside down, you might see York Road to Marsh. Um, well, it's Nichols Gap. They have Nichols Gap there on this version of the map. So Nichols Gap is a general term. Sometimes Nichols Gap, Nicholson Gap, to describe the gap in the mountains out near Fairfield, near Jack's Mountain. Uh, I found this, well, I recently got a nice copy of it, but this is a map uh, of a survey for the Baltimore Shippensburg Road. And this portion of the survey, which is at the York County Archives, says it's the return of the road from Black's Gap to Adam Boos's, uh Tavern, which was near Littlestown. So this is um, uh, Black's Gap uh, of course, is near, you know, west of Cashtown. And Sarah Black's Tavern is where Mummersburg is. So really what they're saying is from the Black's Gap Road at Mummersburg to Littlestown. And it's a really, really fascinating survey. And this is kind of what it looks like. And again, the document is from 1769. And it describes the meads and the bounds of the road. Oh, you can pass through. Thank you. Uh, as it runs through our county, and uh, it's kind of hard to see on this uh, version of it, but I, I, I flipped it around, and the, on the left-hand side, the road that's heading across the top of the map is um, the Swift Run Road, the Black Scalp Road, the road that runs Swift Run Road, Goldenville Road, Hilltown Road, and out through the mountain range. And you can see, I, I blew it up as Sarah Black's Tavern at Mummersburg. So, and Sarah Black, uh, you read about her in the early history of the county um, as being a, a prominent uh, early tavern keeper here. And then the road, of course, is surveyed down through um, the area of Gettysburg. And you can see some of the uh, farmers along the road. The one I think is interesting over here, let's see, oh, I'm gonna put my finger in front of there, Miles Sweeney. And here's the meeting house. That's the Upper Marsh Creek Presbyterian Church. 
at Mummersburg Road and Black Scap Road. Um, no, Mummersburg Road and I'm sorry, um, Belmont Road. And then here, Miles Sweeney, that house, that farm stood where the Michael Christ farm is on um, Black Scap Road uh, near um, uh, Black Horse Tavern Road near the railroad tracks, not far from her tavern, if you know where that is. But Miles Sweeney is like the great grandfather of Harvey Sweeney that lived here at the Farnsworth House. And of course on this map, I don't have a, a good, clear version of, in color of this part of the map, but maybe I do. But I just use this slide. You can see the road to York passing through what is now Gettysburg. And you can see that in 1769, an intersection was created at Samuel Gaddis's Tavern. Do you see they spell it G-A-T-T-Y-S, Gaddis. I think that's fascinating. But uh, there's the Samuel Guinness Tavern. And you might look on the, on the bigger part of the map over here, John Carson. John Carson is the man who Alexander Dobbin purchased his property from. And of course, this is 1769. And Dobbin uh, purchased that property in 1774, although we don't have a deed for it. David Dinwiddie, that's the house that today we were for or the area where the Butterfield Farm is uh, on the northern part of the battlefield near Oak Hill. And the house standing today is from 1808, but it was built by one of the Dinwiddies or Dunwiddies. And, um, and then, of course, we have these houses south uh, of um, the, uh, you know, south along the Baltimore Pike, south of Gettysburg. I'll talk about that. But here is, it says Down Rock Creek. And then it says, Samuel Gaddis' Mill. There's a good version of it. Um, Samuel Gaddis' Mill was later owned by James Gaddis and the Fleming family, and it eventually became uh, McAllister's Mill. So the Gaddis family originally owned McAllister's Mill along Rock Creek. And right just north of it is the Laughlin McVeigh House. Oh, there's, um, there's an old picture. And this started off as a frame mill along Rock Creek, and then later, uh, in the 1820s or 30s, was made into a stone mill that stood there, was used, you know, as an underground railroad stop, and then, you know, was there during the battle, and then eventually removed in the early 1900s. Here is a confusing-looking survey when James Geddes owns that property in trust for John Fleming, who was his brother-in-law. It says for the heirs of John Fleming. And we're actually, Gettysburg is at the bottom of the map. And we're, you can see the Baltimore Pike is along this map. And then it crosses Rock Creek at the bridge there. And so this is the McAllister's Mill property shown on an undated early survey. I'm going to guess it's about from, you know, the heirs of John Fleming from about 1800, maybe in the 1790s. But it shows the road, which is great for me. The Laughlin McVeigh House, which is shown on the Baltimore survey just north of Samuel Geddes' mill, of course, is later the Henry Spangler Farm. And that's the farmhouse across the entrance from the visitor center. So we can look at these early road surveys and actually learn a lot about which houses may be the earliest houses in the county. And of course, you might notice that, um, uh, you know, in the early photographs, uh, we, there was a stored house shown on that survey, and that's probably the house that later is owned by the widow Peffer, which General Meade uses as its headquarters starting on July 5th. And a photograph was taken of it in July of 1863 by um, Gutekunst, one of my favorite Civil War photographers, Frederick Gutekunst. But he, uh, there is a very clear version 
of this image at the National Park Service. This house stood at one time across from the Pike Restaurant. And there was a hole there where the original house stood. As a matter of fact, I remember the house standing there. So it was not there, um, you know, it was there uh, pretty long ago. And then, of course, here we have um, uh, the Rock Creek crossing uh, where the Baltimore Pike crosses it um, south of the town. And this is the John Batchelor isometrical map. And it, you might get an idea of uh, the bridge on the Baltimore Pike, which we don't have early photographs of it. I'm not sure exactly what kind of bridge is there. But it doesn't look like it's built that well in some of these early photographs. Now also, up the Baltimore Pike on the right, you see where it says mail? That's not the McAllister's mail. Oh, we don't have any evidence for it, but I believe that prior to the Baltimore Pike being put in, the road to Samuel Geddes' mail uh, was uh, the road that came into the town of Gettysburg. So I think that you had to cross the creek where the mill is. Um, I wanted to mention on battlefield maps, you might see that mill there too, uh, beside the Baltimore Pike, and where Rock Creek kind of turns and then runs up in the Baltimore Pike. And you might also notice there are photographs of it, uh, and that mill was used as a hospital after the battle, just right on the Baltimore Pike and uh, just south of Cemetery Hill. We do have a nice image of uh, the Baltimore Shippensburg Pike at the base of Cemetery Hill. And um, I colorized that one for you. I thought I colorized a few photographs here so that you could see some of this stuff at the end here. Now, the original Baltimore Pike did not come into the town the way it does now. It came along the base of East Cemetery Hill and it entered the town at where Wade Alley now is. And at Wade Alley, there's the Jenny Wade birthplace, there's a little marker. And that marker says 52M to B. And I don't know when I first realized this, but that, that marker was placed there in like 1930s or 40s to replace another marker that we have the original of at the Adams County Historical Society. So we have a road marker in our collection that used to be at the intersection of Wade Alley and Baltimore Street. And of course it says on it, 52 miles to Baltimore on the tablet. And I, I think that's interesting. Historically, that was the distance given for the town of Gettysburg to Baltimore along uh, the Baltimore Shippensburg Road. We also have one in our collection that's from the York Pike out near New Chester, and it says on it, Philadelphia is 108 miles, York is 22 miles, and Gettysburg is six miles. And we have that original marker from who knows when it was placed there, but from along the original uh, 1747 road. There is one of these, there's two of these markers that are still in existence um, out in Adams County along the old York Road. And one of them is at Cross Keys. If you look down at the, the, where the um, Lutheran home is on the right, you'll see a marker. And then if you go to the Bridges Golf Course, on the left side of the road across from the golf course, there's another one of these markers, and you can still find them and read them. And the distances correlate exactly to this marker that was at Route 30 to New Chester Road. Now, I mentioned earlier, it wasn't until 1829 that Carlisle Street was extended. And see this 1850 map, they're still calling Carlisle Street Baltimore Street. And that road, the Newville Road, was laid out. And you can see the Carlisle Road on this battle map. It's a colorized version of the Warren map. And then you see where it goes up to intersection. The old Carlisle Road went off to the right, and the, uh, the road that went off to the left is the Newville Road. Now, Woody Crisp was so excited about this. So excuse me if this is a little nerdy, but this was Woody Crisp died, but I just remember this was his most exciting find of his entire life. We knew 
that the original Carlisle Road connected with the Mummersburg Road somewhere down near the town. And we had always been told that the Kitzmiller House, shown as Kitzman on this map, was an old toll gate. So we theorized that that fence line was the old road. And Woody further um, theorized that part of the modern um, uh, Howard Avenue is placed along this course. And he was just so like that. And then one day we were looking at photographs of the 1938 reunion. And this is an aerial photograph of the camp around the Gettysburg College and Howard Avenue is crossing the center of the photograph towards Barlow's Knoll. And so, you know, Dilger's battery would be right, right there, Wheeler's battery would be right there. And this is the camp, the college playing fields, or the campsite for uh, the 1938 reunion. By the way, Adams County Historical Society will be down here. I guess just a little out of the view. So, look here. Do you see that along this fence line there are cars driving? In 1938, those cars are driving along the course of uh, the old um, Carlisle Road, which I just find is fascinating. And here's something that you should know. It's not on the Warren map of the battlefield. Do you know that the Warren map, our main map for understanding the battlefield, does not indicate roads or farm lanes? It only indicates fences. So if there are two fences on either side of a road, the road is shown on the map because there's fences along it. Or like if there's a break in the trees shown because a road goes through the break in the trees, you can see where a road is. But if a road goes across an open field and there are not fences along it, the road is not shown on the map. And so theoretically, when the 11th Corps is out there fighting, you know, there is an old roadbed out there. I wonder if it had a fence along it. I wonder if it's the edge of the 11th Corps skirmish line for a while. But we're just, we just don't know. Okay, I was going to talk about that. Okay. Oh, that was the Harrisburg Road. And I think I just wanted to mention on this map that we have a photograph of it. The Harrisburg Road put in in 1811 that comes out from near the high school and across Rock Creek into town. There was a covered bridge at that location at the time of the battle. And the covered bridge is mentioned by the 17th Connecticut in some of their accounts of the battle. And, of course, uh, here's that stone bridge shown on the York Pike we talked about earlier. And also, um, on Batchelder's asymmetrical map, they show the railroad bridge, which has uh, been rebuilt just after the battle. And then on the Hanover Road, there's a covered bridge. And there's that photograph from the 1880s from Banner's Hill looking towards the town. And you can look over and see the covered bridge on the Hanover Road. So there are a few covered bridges that led into the town along these roads that we know of at the time. I'm not sure if there may have been a covered bridge on the Baltimore Pike, it's just we don't have any good accounts of it. And you know, obviously some of these covered bridges could have been built after the battle, but John Batchelder's asymmetrical map is pretty good evidence. And that map was drawn in late 1863, published in 1864. There's a nice view of the bridge. The creek looks really deep at that time, doesn't it? Probably backed up by all the dams along Rock Creek. Of course, the other thing I wanted to mention, here's the Emmitsburg Road, laid out in 1801, is these roads are not necessarily laid out in a nice fashion, and some of the roads, like the Tony Town Road or the Emmitsburg Road, are muddy. Here is the map drawn in 1803 that shows this area. We are on lot number six on Alexander Dobbins' spring lots of the town. And you can see, he calls this, on this map, the Tawny Town Road. In Dobbins' deeds, he calls it Water Street. But try to wrap your head around this for a moment. This is the Tawny Town Road out here in front of us. It's not a mistake. It's the Tawny Town Road. The Baltimore Pike 
comes in at the base of East Cemetery Hill, and it runs up where the alley is, and it enters the town up at Wade Alley. That's the Baltimore Pike. It's not until 1808 that they reroute the Baltimore Pike up and over Cemetery Hill and down into the town into what we call Baltimore Street. Does that make sense? So th this is the 20 Town Road. So where does the 20 Town Road go then? Here is a map that was drawn by Woody Chris that I kind of like because he shows you over here some of the development that was occurring along the original uh, Baltimore Pike that led into the town. Thomas Breeden had actually segregated the area out there into lots. That's why there's a lot of fences that the North Carolina Tar Heels and Louisiana Tigers have to cross to get to the top of Cemetery Hill. And you see, if you look here, you can kind of see the Emmitsburg Roads laid out in 1801. And if you you see how the when they bring the Baltimore Pike up over, it turns right up there near the Jenny Wade House. But if you draw a straight line from Baltimore Street today up through the National Cemetery and down the road, where would that come out if it just went straight? It comes out on the Tawny Town Road. So that is the original Tawny Town Road. And of course, why do I like this photograph? Because there's a dead horse in the middle of the Tawny Town Road. It's like July 7th, July 8th, July 9th. Can someone move the dead horse out of the middle of the road? It's bothering me. <laughs> and here we have, uh, again, the Tony Town Road around 1900. Look how horrible the Tony Town Road is. So while there are real nice paved roads on the battlefield and people are riding around in their carriages on these really nice macadamized roads. The Tony Town Road, the local road, is just, you know, a dirt road filled with ditches. Now we have the original grading book for the Chambersburg Turnpike. So originally, the Chambersburg Street did not lead to Chambersburg. It was called West York Street. But in 1809, the state legislature passed an act for the extension, a western extension of the Gettysburg Petersburg Railroad or, um, Turnpike Company. So Petersburg being Littlestown, that's the original name of Littlestown, and uh, it runs up to Gettysburg and they're going to put a western extension out of that turnpike. And so we have the original grading book from the Chambersburg Turnpike. And it's completed in 1815. And here's the area um, beyond Willoughby's Run. As a matter of fact, do you see at the very bottom it says bridge over Willoughby's Run with an apostrophe S? <laughs> you, you might know that I'm really into apostrophe S's on Willoughby's Run. From 1815, what do you think of that? That's proof to, to, that uh, if you don't know, the township has eliminated apostrophe S from Willoughby's Run. I think it's PennDOT that did it. They don't like apostrophe S's. So they even have a description of the bridge, and they have uh, David McConaughey's field. David McConaughey was the owner of um, the McPherson farm at that time. Here is a really neat uh, thing that talks about the, 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 the road as it runs into the town, and it runs to the diamond, and it talks about the lots it runs by. So it's really, really, really fascinating stuff. And so by 1815, Chambersburg Street is called Chambersburg Street because all of a sudden we have the Chambersburg Turnpike, which again is the western extension of the Gettysburg-Petersburg Turnpike Company. And you can see the crushed stone on the road in this 1863 photograph. So it's macadamized. Or as Gary likes to say, Telfordized. But look at that. And you know how they crush the stone on it? Is they fill a big barrel up with water. And then they would roll the barrel of water over the stones. Does that make sense? It's not, it's not very complicated. And then they had some kind of tar substance. 
So here is, I colorized a few images for you. Here is uh, 1,900 photographs of the bridge over Marsh Creek on the Chambersburg Turnpike. I like colorizing the photographs. Here's a guy standing on the bridge. So this is the bridge that was there at the time of the battle that the first shots of the fighting occurred around that the Confederates crossed on their way to the battlefield. Isn't that wild? And that thing was torn down, I think in the 1920s, of course, to you know, have a nice, modern, improved bridge. And then there is, of course, the Chambersburg Turnpike at the Whistler House, the first shot marker. You see the first shot marker there by the house. Oh, I don't know what happened there. I must have forgot to take that one out. Here is the turnpike at Willoughby's Run from a 1910 photograph Kurt Musselman gave me. This house still stands there. So if you stand at the McPherson Ridge restroom and you look down the hill, down the hill on the left by Willoughby's Run, this house still stands. And then here's the toll gate at Cash Town for the uh, Chambersburg Pike. Uh, I should mention that this no longer stands. We're on Route 30, and to the left is the Ortana Road. And today there's a little empty um, a field there at that spot where the uh, Cashtown Turnpike was. But, as I mentioned earlier, people don't like to pay money to go on the Turnpike. So here's an 1843 illustration that shows uh, a wagon on the unfinished railroad excavation, avoiding riding on the Chambersburg Turnpike, which is out over to the right on the other side of that fence, which is just fascinating. And of course, here's an 1863 photograph of the Chambersburg Turnpike. And I, I meant to put it in here, but there's an 1867 photograph looking back at the railroad cut, where they built a fence across the unfinished railroad to keep locals from using that road to avoid paying the toll. Locals. And I have one more thing that I wanted to mention. I have a real, and I just have some photocopies of it here, but we have the original at the Historical Society. This is the layout for the survey for the Wheatfield Road. And at the bottom of the map is Joseph Sherfy's Peach Orchard. And at the top of the map is the Tawny Town Road. And it's the road that leads from the road to Nunnemaker's Mill to uh, um, uh, Mill out near Barlow. I forget which, maybe it's Horner's Mill it leads to. But you can see they're actually using the extensionist road is Sachs Road up at the very top of the map. And it comes onto the Tawny Town Road and then down the Wheatfield Road. And it shows you along the road who lives there. Like Hauk and McCreary. John Hauk, that lived on Baltimore Street, that owned the Jenny Wade house. He was a business partner with Samuel McCreary that lived across the street, and Samuel McCreary had a brickyard. And they were using the area, they purchased the area of Devil's Den and were busting up the rocks around Devil's Den into cubes that could be used for construction material in the buildings in the town. And they were also using some of the substance that got from around Devil's Den to make bricks across the street. And so it's Halkin McCreary's brickyard for a time. Oh, but you see, here it is. Iker's Mill. I said uh, Nunnemaker's Mill, but Iker's Mill. Um, and Iker's Mill would be Nunnemaker's Mill. Oh, but they're saying Iker's Mill and Cumberland. Um, this is just the part of the road that goes from uh, the edge of Cumberland Township over. And Mark's Church, of course, is on the bottom of the pipe. Oh, near Horner's Mill Road, I get it. So here on this map, you see the area of the Peach Orchard. Do you ever wonder, you, you see this map, how they show the lane going over from the Emmitsburg Road? Do you ever run, wonder when you get to that turn, and the road turns, and you think, wow, it should go straight. It used to go straight, at least for a time. Um, here is, again, the area of the Tawny Town Road, and you can see heirs of Adam Miller, who obviously owned Little Round Top, and Halkin McCurry owning land out in front. 
And of course, you probably know where I'm going with all this. Some of you already know where I'm going. Here's the land of Peter Trosel. So I turned the map. So north is, you know, north is up. And you see Peter Trosel. And then below it, you see Jacob Banner, who's the Rose Farm. He owns the Rose Farm. J Jacob Scherfe, who has a peach orchard. And here's the Wheatfield Road. And right here, what does it show in the middle of the road? There's a stone in the middle of the road. And how do we know that? Because we have photographs of it. One of my favorite things in the world. But it's shown on the survey. There's a stone or a rock in the middle of the road. What, are you supposed to drive around it? First beat bump. You know? What's really interesting in stereo, I have this in stereo, there's a drop-off like of six or seven feet on the other side of the rock. So once you pass the rock, then you have to drive down a hill that you, that's kind of hard to see in this on the road. So um, I am still looking for I have not found it. Yeah, I think it's, it must be removed between um, 1898 and 1900. I can't find an article in the newspaper. Surely, there's got to be some mention of the important moment when they remove the rock from the middle of the road. So everybody keep their eyes out for it. And uh, you know, But I do have a new piece of the puzzle when they put the road in and they purposely put the road around. Can't they move the road a little bit somewhere else? Why has it got to go around the rock? OK. Well, thanks for coming to the program. And I'll be here for a moment if anybody has any questions.